Hi, and welcome to a replay of the talk that I did at the Koha Con 2020 conference in Wellington in New Zealand. Um, this talk is about um, Unicode and Perl. If you would like to follow along with the slides, you can download the slides um, at uh, this URL. Um, while you're typing that in and loading those up, I'll carry on and talk about my favorite thing, which is, of course, me. Um, so my name's Grant, I'm Grant McLean. I'm a developer and trainer at Catalyst, um, where I actually don't work on Koha, although I know the team well. Um, I have a number of modules up on CPAN that are badly neglected. Um, I've been active in the Perl community for many years. Um, and if you were to look at my CPAN modules, uh, you might imagine uh, that I'm a big fan of XML, but you would be sadly mistaken. Um, actually, my current obsession, coding out of hours, is um, a project called sudokuexchange.com. Um, if you're at all interested in Sudoku, then you might want to give that one a try. Okay, so moving on. When I proposed this talk, I said I was going to be talking about Unicode and Perl and the practicalities of working with Unicode. But what I'm actually going to be talking about is encoding. Um, so why? Well, what I've found over the years is when people come to me with a Unicode problem, it's almost always an encoding problem. So if we focus on that bit, hopefully I can um, clear some things up. When people do come to me for help, um, there's a range of questions. Um, and I find that often they're rhetorical questions that people don't actually want the answer to the question they're asking. All they really want is a quick fix. Um, a lot of them can be boiled down to uh, questions of what do I need to do? And this one I can uh, answer. Unfortunately, you might not like the answer. You need to understand. So that's what this session is about, helping you understand how Perl handles um, Unicode um, and what you need to do to get along with it. Now, this section here um, is briefly looking at some really basic concepts and if you are comfortable with different number systems and in particular hexadecimal then by all means skip ahead. Um, I just want to take a moment to bring people who might not be so comfortable with that up to speed. So the basics are to a computer everything is numbers. Numbers are numbers, letters are numbers, sounds are numbers, pictures and numbers, it's all numbers. And in fact, inside the computer, it's all ones and zeros. When we count, um, we use a system um, called the decimal system, a base 10 numbering system. Um, we typically start counting at one, um, but the system has 10 different symbols. That's what makes it a base 10 system. So the extra one is the zero. Now when we count up using each of those symbols in turn, eventually once we get to nine, we've used all the symbols. So if we want to carry on to the next number, we need to introduce an extra digit. Um, and so in this case, we'd start uh, with 10 and carry on through 11, 12, and so on until we get up to 19 and then we do it all over again. Now, as I mentioned, computers use ones and zeros or binary, and the rules are exactly the same, except there are only two symbols, zeros and ones. So once you've counted up to one, you've used all the symbols, we apply the same rule, we introduce an extra digit, and then we can go through that same sequence again. Now we've run out of digits again, and we introduce an extra digit, run through the sequence again, and each time we're getting twice as many um, digits in the sequence, and so on. And what happens is we very quickly 
reach a point where the ones and zeros are quite long, unwieldy numbers that are very hard for humans to work with. So what we've developed over the years is another numbering system that's common um, with computers, which is called the hexadecimal system. And this one uses 16 different symbols. So it uses the 0 to 9 that we're familiar with from decimal, and then six more, the letters A to F. And the advantage of this system is it's very easy um, for people, typically programmers, to convert between hexadecimal numbers and binary numbers and vice versa. Um, because if you look on the screen here, you'll see the point at which we need an extra digit here aligns with the point that hex needs an extra digit. Um, if you put on some leading zeros, every hex digit is exactly four binary digits. Whereas if you're converting between decimal and binary, the points at which you need an extra digit never line up. Um, it, it is quite tricky converting between these two. So that's all hexadecimal is. It's just a base 16 numbering system, which is sort of a compromise between the numbers we're used to and the numbers that computers work with. So moving on up, ah, just briefly there. Binary numbers, um, the largest number that you can make using eight binary digits is the number 255, which in hex is the number FF. And we'll see that cropping up uh, over and over as we proceed. So. Now you have all the information you need to understand this terrible joke, which I won't dwell on. We move on. So the term binary digit is usually abbreviated to bit. So one binary digit is a bit. Eight bits we refer to as a byte. Now in theory, that's a um, ambiguous term because a byte was originally the number of bits you needed to um, encode a character, and some computers used five, maybe six bits. But nowadays, all computers use eight bits for that. Um, other options haven't been used by any computers in the last 50 years, so it's not really an ambiguous term. But there is a, another term, octet, which always means exactly eight bits. Um, you can think of an octet and a byte as being the same thing, but you'll see in standards documents um, for protocols and file formats and things, they often use the term octet to unambiguously mean eight bits. And the important thing about a byte, an eight bit unit, is it's the smallest addressable unit of storage, which all that means is if you're grabbing some data, say from a file or from a memory location, what you'll get back is some number of bytes. Each byte will have eight bits in it, but you had to get whole bytes. Now, I mentioned that um, text letters are encoded in a computer as numbers. So if we want to input some text into a computer, the characters that we recognize get converted into numbers after they've been processed, if the uh, program is returning some characters to us to read the output, they get converted from numbers back to text. You may have done an exercise like this when you were a kid. Um, here's a secret message and up the top there's a, a key that can be used to map the numbers in the message to letters to decode it. Or more recently, you might have done a puzzle like this, where once again, a number is used to represent each of the letters. In both those examples, um, the numbers were in a somewhat random order because that was part of the fun. In real life, um, when you send a message um, that's encoded as numbers, Obviously, the sender and the receiver need to agree on which number maps to which letter, and it makes sense to, uh, to arrange them in a logical fashion. So one of the, the early ways um, of doing that 
is a system called ASCII, the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. Um, when it was introduced, this is the sort of technology people were dealing with at the time. This is what a computer terminal looked like. It was literally a keyboard and a printer all in one unit. There was no screen. So if the computer needed to display a message to the user, it had to send it to the printer and a line of print or multiple lines would be printed out and the paper would advance out the top. So if you've, if you've ever wondered why programming languages like Perl and Python and some others um, include a um, function called print, they inherited it from the basic programming language, which was created around the time when this technology was current. And if a program was outputting a message, it had to print it. So this is um, the ASCII character set. Um, if we look at that, we'll see there are 26 uppercase letters, 26 lowercase letters, um, there are 33 punctuation and space characters, and 33 um, control characters. If we look more closely at this one, for example, we can see that the number that represents the capital letter A is the decimal number 65, or the hex number 41. Now, to get that hex number, looking at the chart, um, it's always going to be represented as a two-digit number, and you'd get the first digit from the heading at the start of the row, and the second digit from the heading at the top of the column. So we can see the four here and the one here, put them together, you get 41 hex for the A. Now these control characters up here are not characters like letters and numbers that would be printed and the user would, would see um, marks on the page. These are for controlling functions of the terminal. So for example, this one here, 0A, is the line feed control character. And that literally caused the paper to be fed out one line. Um, so um, when a line had been printed, a line feed character would be used to advance the page, um, move the paper out so that the operator could read it. Um, that's followed a bit further along. 0D is the carriage return control character, which would move the print head back to the beginning of the line um, so that it could start printing the next line. Those were two separate actions, a line feed and a carriage return. And if we look at 07, that was the bell character. And that literally, on those old terminal, teletype terminals, it would literally um, use a solenoid to activate a little hammer that hit a little bell and it would go ding. So that's the ASCII um, character set. If you add up all those different groups of characters uh, in there, the numbers and the letters and the punctuation and the control characters, there are 128 different symbols or control codes. Um, and that requires seven bits in order to, um, in, to represent those numbers in binary. Now, modern computers work with eight bits when they're getting data from a disk or sending it on a network or whatever, they tend to operate eight bits at a time. So what we usually do is we put the seven bits for an ASCII character in a byte and we leave the eighth bit set to zero. So if you're looking at ASCII data as a byte, the first bit will always be zero. Working with Perl, if you had a number for an ASCII character and you wanted to know what character it was, you could use the CHR function, which is short for character, um, and it will convert that for you. You can give it the number in hexadecimal um, by using that 0x prefix, or you could even use 0b to provide the number in binary. And all those um, lines there are equivalent to 
printing out that character. You can also, in a double quoted string, use backslash x for um, putting in a two digit hex value to say, give me this character number, which once again, in our example, is a capital A. You can have a string with multiple backslash x um, escape codes in there and um, include a whole bunch of different characters that way. Going the other way, if you had a character and you wanted to know what its ASCII code was, you could use the ORD function, which is short for the ordinal value of that character. So here I passed an A and it returned 65. And if I wanted to, I could convert that to hex. Now here is um, a tiny snippet of um, HTML. We could put that and just that in a file and then look at the file using a tool called a hex dump tool. Um, in this example, I used a hex dump tool. You can see here the command was xxd. That um, tool comes with the vim editor. So if you've got vim installed, um, you've got xxd. Um, there are, are other tools. Um, I think indeed there's one called hex dump. But what we can see here is a ser series of um, hex characters. The spaces between aren't really significant. They're just there to make it easier for us to read. So here's a two digit hex number followed by another two digit hex number next to it. Um, the three C, if we look that up in the ASCII chart, would be this opening angle bracket or less than sign. And the seven zero would be this P. And so we can see the hex numbers here and we can see the ASCII characters over here. Um, not all characters are represented here. For example, zero A is the line feed at the end of the line and any non-printable character will be presented as just a dot. Um, and the other part of this is over here, this is the number of bytes we are into the file. It's a, a bit like a line number, effectively. So, I mentioned before that the first bit of an ASCII byte is always zero. But if we put that another way, if the first bit is not a zero, it's not ASCII, which of course leads to the question of what is it? There is this concept called extended ASCII, which is, no, there is no one thing you could point to and say, this is extended ASCII. Um, there are a lot of different um, encodings or code pages which start with 128 ASCII mappings and are followed by 128 other character mappings. ISO 8859-1 is, is one of the popular ones, um, also referred to as Latin 1, and that's a, um, a set of mappings that works for the Western European languages. So in addition to ASCII, it adds um, letters with um, the sort of accents that would be required to to um, represent words in French or German or Spanish, um, but it doesn't cater for a whole range of other European languages. 8859-2 um, adds support for Eastern European languages like Polish. Um, it doesn't have support for the Cyrillic languages. Um, they have their own code page. So as you can see, there are, there are a lot of them the IBM PC um, burned into its BIOS. It, it had um, a character set or a code page that was compatible with ASCII for the first 128. And the second 128 included um, line and box drawing characters that could be used to um, draw sort of crude windowing interfaces on the screen back in the DOS application era before Windows. Now, the problem, the, the, 
there are a number of problems, but the first problem with these different code pages is that they are mutually exclusive. So if you're using one code page that you need to, to um, say, present a phrase in German, then you won't be able to present that phrase in, for example, an Asian language, say Korean, because the code page, there is no code page that supports both German characters and Korean characters. So that's the, the first issue. Um, but the basic issue is there just aren't enough characters in uh, a, a, an 8-bit code. So, for example, ASCII was designed for American um, computer systems, but even though it includes the dollar sign, it doesn't include the cent sign, so you could argue it's not even sufficient for um, American. Um, Latin 1 added characters, as I mentioned, for Western European languages. Um, it added the pound symbol, um, which was used, is used in uh, the United Kingdom, but it didn't have the euro symbol uh, because the euro hadn't been invented at the time and the um, Latin 1 code page filled up that 8-bit space so there was no room to put the euro symbol in. Um, Microsoft came along later and they liked Latin 1 so they embraced and extended it. Um, they decided that the, the extra control characters that it defined were completely unnecessary, nobody wanted those, so they replaced them with um, typographical quote mark symbols, the so-called smart quotes and M dashes and such like, and indeed the Euro symbol. So code page 1252 um, is, has been commonly used, it's a variation of Latin 1. So all these different code pages are now known as legacy encodings. And to solve the problems that they um, left us with, um, we now use Unicode. Unicode, at its core, is simply mapping the definition of a character to a number. So it's just a huge list of characters and assigning numbers to them. Now, there is more to it. Unicode also defines attributes for those characters. So you could look up the Unicode um, database for a particular character and find out, is it a digit character? Is it a space character? Um, there's a number of other attributes there. But the core functionality of Unicode is it's mapping numbers to characters in fact. When Unicode was first released, um, it had several thousand characters in there, so it was already um, more comprehensive than ASCII. And over the following years, more characters were added. Um, in fact, during this period here, some characters were actually removed and redefined. Um, but then once all the, um, the so-called CJK, Chinese, Japanese, Korean language support, was added and finalised, I think they've now decided they won't remove any character definitions. Um, and you can see now we've got approaching uh, 150,000 characters in there. The theoretical maximum is around a million. And the reason for um, including all these different characters is to support all the different human languages. So here's a list of languages um, that are supported by Unicode. Um, I think it's version 13 we're up to now. This list has 782 languages on it. Um, piece of trivia for you, it does not include Klingon. Um, Klingon was proposed um, to the Unicode Consortium, but it didn't get enough support and they decided they would stick with non-fictional languages, at least for, for a start. And this is what a Unicode character definition looks like. We've got the character itself here, our friend, capital A. We've got a description of that character, um, and the descriptions are always in uppercase. Um, and then we've got 
the, what's called the code point number, which is um, a hexadecimal number, which is always at least four digits, sometimes more, and with a U plus prefix on the beginning so that you can immediately see this number represents a character in Unicode. So U for Unicode. The first 128 characters exactly match ASCII. So if you have um, a document that's in ASCII, it's already in Unicode. Um, Unicode is a superset of ASCII. The next 128 characters are um, exactly the same as that Latin 1 code page I mentioned earlier, and then that's followed by blocks of um, character definitions for different languages and different symbols, um, which we'll see a bit more of now. Um, here's a tool that um, I created for exploring the Unicode um, character database. Um, the easiest way to find it, it's called the Unicode Character Finder, is to um, Google that. So that phrase, Unicode Character Finder, and hopefully it'll be the first hit that you get to. I haven't got a fancy um, domain name for it, it's just sitting on my website. And we'll zoom in on that. Now what this does is it allows you to search. So if I wanted to find the euro symbol, I could just type euro and up. In the blink of an eye, come all the um, character definitions that include that word Euro that I typed. And then if I click on one of them, I'll get the, a large version of that character displayed up here, some information about it, and we'll be drilling down into what these mean later, um, including a link to a PDF for the characters in this block. Um, so that's one way of using it. Another way of using it is if you had a character and you wanted to know what it was, you could simply paste it in here. So if I put in the capital A, then we get to see the description of that character um, and which block it's in um, and some other information. You can then, uh, you can also use the next and previous buttons to explore characters around it, um, or the scroll wheel, just rolling through the characters there, or you can click on chart and bring up the, um, in this case, the ASCII um, section, and you could um, click on one of these characters, like the lowercase a, and when you click on it, it appears up here. So, oh, and you can use next and, and previous on these um, pages, or you can use this drop down menu um, and see there are many, many blocks of characters through there. Um, so, if we picked on the Greek extended ones here, um, we can see here's small letter epsilon um, with one particular accent which I won't attempt to pronounce. Now one of the problems you'll find is that when you're exploring this many of these characters if you were to select them um, like this one for example we can see the definition but we can't see the actual character because I don't have a font installed that supports that character and th there won't be fonts that, that support every single um, Unicode character. Um, but your system, depending what platform you're running, um, will have fallback fonts to display some of the characters that um, are less commonly supported by mainstream fonts. Um, and another um, feature of the Unicode definitions is this area here, commonly referred to as emoji, which have a whole range of different 
called pictographs. So you can use that to explore the Unicode character database. There's another standards body um, which um, works alongside Unicode. Um, so there's a standard called the Universal Coded Character Set, or UCS, which is um, essentially, it is Unicode. So the two standards are developed um, in parallel. When a character is added to one, it's added to the other it, with the same definition. Um, they have different release dates, so at any given time the current release of one may have more characters defined than the other, but then the other one will catch up with those exact same definitions. So UCS um, is that other standard, but you can think of it as just Unicode as well. Now, Unicode gives us a number for each of these characters, but that doesn't directly tell us how that would be represented as bytes. So for example, this character, the capital letter A with a macron, is hex 100. So we can already see it's going to take more than one byte to represent that. So how do we do that? Uh, to quote Larry Wall, he was actually uh, talking about Perl, but here he could have been talking about Unicode. There is more than one way to encode a Unicode code point number into bytes. Now, the first way that was commonly used dates back to when people thought that 16 bits was going to be enough for all the characters. Um, that very quickly proved not to be the case. Um, so UCS2 is now considered obsolete. I believe it has been used extensively in, for example, um, SMS messages. Um, and um, it was also adopted quite early by uh, platforms such as um, Java and, and maybe um, Windows, so-called ANSI as well. But this system assumed each character was a maximum, well, it assumed 16 bits. So every character took up two bytes. But that still leaves us with um, some problems because even if you say, oh, well, we'll just use two bytes for each character, one question is which order should those bytes appear? So if you use, uh, if you put what's called the most significant byte first, uh, we refer to that as the big endian format. And if you do it the opposite way around with the least significant byte first, that's the little endian format. So there are two flavors of UCS2. Um, in order to determine which one was used, they defined a character called the byte order mark or BOM. And this is simply the character with the number FEFF. -F -F and you would put that as the very first character of your file. And when someone's reading the file, if it starts with FE, they know it's a big Indian file. And if it starts with FF, they know it's little Indian. But as I mentioned, you can only address the first 65,000 characters of Unicode with UCS2. So UTF, um, builds on that by using what's called surrogate pairs. So most characters, uh, most commonly used characters, are indeed just two bytes. But if you need to address a character outside that first um, plane, it's called, um, then you use a pair of 16-bit characters. Um, so-called surrogate pairs. Now I'm not going to explain how that works because almost nobody needs to know um, and you can look it up when you need to, um, but what it boils down to is when you use UTF-16, characters are either two bytes or four, byte, four bytes. <coughs> Excuse me. And once again, we still have the problem with 
Big Endian and Little Endian, and we still use byte order marks to distinguish. If you had an ASCII file and you converted it to UTF-16, the file would be twice as large and it would have no additional information in it. Um, another feature of UTF-16 is that it's not really convenient to use it from C. Uh, strings in C typically um, are terminated by a null byte, a, a zero, zero byte. Um, but in um, UTF-16, it's common for every second character to be a null. So that to a C program, it would look like the end of a string. Um, if we took um, that phrase we used earlier, in this case, it's um, translated into Maori, and we're um, now using some characters with non-ASCII uh, with accents on them. Um, so if I hex dump a UTF-16 um, version of this file, you can see that that opening angle bracket there is now represented by two bytes, 003C. Um, in this particular case, I didn't include the byte order mark, but it's pretty obvious what order these bytes are. Um, and if I look along a bit further, this character here is the I with the macron on top. That's character number 12B in um, Unicode. So, um, in fact, if I swap to Unicode character finder and I just type in 12B, then that's the character and details about it. And here's the code chart page that contains that character. If we hex dump that same file but encoded in little Indian format, looks like this and you'll see that the order of the two bytes is swapped so instead of 003c it's 3c00 instead of 012b it's 2b01 so utf16 is kind of inconvenient in that each character could be two bytes or it might be four um, the most common ones you would use are two bytes. So a lot of software only supports the two byte versions, which is um, not very good. Um, UTF-32 is another way that you could encode characters, uh, encode Unicode characters, and um, it uses, as the name implies, 32 bits or four bytes for every character. It's straightforward, you don't need to use um, surrogate pairs. Every character is four bytes. Um, it still has the problem with, uh, we need to know what order they are, big Indian or little Indian. And if you had an ASCII file and you converted it to UTF-32, you'd find that it had quadrupled in size. It was now four times bigger and had no extra data. Here, for example, is that same file um, in um, UTF-32, hex dumped, and um, here's our 12B character, which now takes four bytes instead of two. Finally, we come to um, an encoding called UTF-8, which is probably the most commonly used encoding. Um, certainly, when sending files across networks, um, they would typically be UTF-8. Um, so this one uses a variable number of bytes per code point. So it might be one, it might be four, or some number in between. So the ASCII range, 0 to 7F, use one byte. Um, and... The ranges that follow use progressively more and more bytes. So you might be asking how this works. Well, in this case, I am going to explain how it works because it's kind of a cool hack and also it helps us understand later some of the problems that we run into um, when we're using Unicode from Perl. <laughs>
Now, the way it works is if the first byte bit, sorry, if the first bit of a byte is a zero, then that is a one byte character. That's the ASCII range. If it's not, then the number of ones is equivalent to the number of bytes for the character. So this one starts with two ones, which has to be followed by a zero so that we know we've reached the end of the ones. So two ones means there will be two bytes. And these bits that I've marked as X's are where we put the actual data, which will make more sense here. If I work through an example, the euro symbol is hex 20AC. If we take the 20AC and spell that out in binary here, then we're going to need three bytes to encode it. So we put the three ones at the beginning, followed by a zero. Each continuation byte always starts one zero. And then we put the lower six bits of data in the third byte, the next six bits of data in the second byte, and the remaining four bits of data in the first byte. So what was the Unicode character 20AC is now the three bytes E2, H2, AC. And just looking at those, there's no obvious um, mapping between these bytes in that um, code point number. But this is the mechanism that's used to take the bits for the code point number and spread them across um, a variable number of bytes in an unambiguous way. So that uh, if um, a program is reading a file and, and maybe it, it comes in part way through the file, it can see if the byte starts with one zero, then it's part way through a character and it can either back up um, till it finds the start byte or it can carry on forward until it finds um, a character that starts with either a zero or with two or more ones. If we took that E2H2AC and plugged it in here, E2 8 to AC, we would find that um, it's decoded those bytes from UTF-8 to um, hex, and then it's looked up that number and found the character that we were looking for. And any character you put in here, um, you can see the UTF-8 encoding over here. So that's UTF-8. So we saw uh, four different encodings. UCS2 is obsolete, um, so don't use that. But if you have to make a choice, I would say choose UTF-8. Um, it's pretty much the default that people use these days. If you have um, a file with data in a different encoding, a different um, Unicode encoding, so uh, UTF-16 or 32 and the different variations of those, you can convert it to UTF-8. Um, there's a command line tool called iconv, which um, uses minus F for, to specify which encoding you're converting from, and minus T for which encoding you're converting to. Give it a file name and it will convert it and you can redirect that into a new file. So that works fine going from any Unicode encoding to any other Unicode encoding. You can also use it to go from one of the legacy encodings like Latin 1 or in this case Win Latin 1 to Unicode. Um, you can try going the other way. Um, and that might work, but you might encounter a situation where your source Unicode file includes a character that has no equivalent in, um, in the legacy encoding. And so then you'll simply get an error at that point. So 
when people start working with Unicode, um, the first thing they want to do is not work with Unicode um, and not deal with those different types of encodings. And that's a perfectly um, rational approach. Um, if you were using, for example, HTML, you could include one of these non-ASCII characters, such as the Euro symbol, um, by encoding it with ASCII characters. So if we viewed this um, snippet of HTML in a browser, we would see a Euro symbol at this point. And what's happened is the name that we can see there, the Euro name, combined with an ampersand and a semicolon is called a named character entity. And the HTML document type definition, or DTD, um, defines a number of named characters. If you want to include a character that's not in that list, you can simply use its number. Um, for example, 8364 is the decimal version of um, the Euro symbols character number. Or you can use ampersand hash X and use the hex version. Um, so there's our familiar 20AC. So if we were using that, um, sorry, right. So that's how we can achieve that in HTML. So we've, we've included some Unicode characters in our page, but our source file only contains ASCII data. Similarly, if we were trying to do the same thing with JavaScript, um, we could use the backslash u escape followed by four hex characters or hex digits. And um, that's how we could represent one code point number. Um, if we needed to refer to uh, one, one of the characters outside the first 65,000, um, we would need to use a surrogate pair arrangement, which you could do um, in the same way, you, you would put backslash u in the first one and then backslash u in the second one, which is a bit inconvenient. Um, in um, JavaScript, you can also um, use a function to convert uh, from a number to a character or string and then uh, combine that with, with other characters in your code. And that backslash u escape the exact same syntax is used in JSON, the data serialization uh, format, and um, it has the exact same meaning there. CSS uses a very similar um, notation, but without the U. So it's simply uh, backslash followed by the hex characters, which in this case I've used to define a different character for my bullet rather than a boring black dot. So if the first stage of dealing with Unicode was denial, there are a number of stages that we could go through. Uh, we'll just fast forward through those until we reach acceptance. At this point, we decide we want to use all the characters from Unicode and we realize that we can just type them in um, or copy and paste them into our HTML file and just save it. Um, and when we do that, um, we do need to specify what encoding we're using. So for example, in Vim, I would type this command to specify UTF-8 encoding, but most graphical editors, you'll probably find that's the default. Um, so, you type the characters in or paste them in and then just save them. And what you need to do then is with um, HTML, you need to make sure your web server is properly configured. So if you're saving your files as UTF-8, then you want the web server to put the right content type, character set, encoding declaration on the responses that it sends out when browsers visit the site. So this is how you might do it on Apache or Nginx. 
Um, I'm not actually sure what the default is these days. It's probably UTF-8. It used to be Latin 1. So this is what a content type header should look like. And if you're dynamically generating HTML, you'll need to make sure your code is generating a header that looks like this. So if we did that, we put the UTF-8 data in the file, we set the right header um, in our web server. When someone views the page, they will see this um, displayed and that character is, is displayed exactly um, as we intended. However, if we had the wrong header on there, if we had it set to Latin 1, Latin 1 as a legacy encoding um, is one byte per character. And in UTF-8, the Euro symbol takes three characters. So we end up with this mess where we expected um, the Euro symbol. So if there's a mismatch between how your file is saved and how your web server is serving that up to browsers, then this is the sort of effect you will see. So if we just drill into that a little bit further, these are the three bytes that would have been saved in your file to encode the Euro symbol in UTF-8. If, however, your browser has been told that the file is Latin 1, it will see the E2 as an A with a circumflex. It will see the AC as this sort of fallen over L shape, um, which is a mathematical or a logical not symbol. Um, this 82, however, is a control character. Now on the previous slide we saw um, there was a sort of a comma like thing there but this is a control character which is not going to give you something visible and what's happened is the browser has decided although the header said latin one a very common mistake is that people use um, the windows latin one which has replaced these control characters with typographical symbols um, and in fact uh, that character or that byte number 82 um, in WinLatin1 is um, a low closing quotation mark. So even though the header said it's Latin1, the browser guessed that we probably meant Windows Latin1. Now, if you're using maybe shared hosting or something and you don't have direct control over the web server configuration. Um, it might insist on adding a character set definition that says it's Latin 1. You can put a meta tag in your document to override that. So when you save your HTML, you can put um, effectively an override of the content type header with exactly the, the value that it would have had. Or the new syntax in HTML5, you can um, use this simpler syntax. And that's saying, ignore what the web server said in its header, this document, or the, the bytes that you're receiving are UTF-8. So, let's start dealing with uh, Unicode from Perl. Here's a relatively simple Perl script. We're defining the name of a file we're opening that file, and there's no error checking, but we'll come to that shortly. We're opening the file, then we're reading a line from the file, line after line, and printing each line. So just open a file, read and print each line. So when I run that, um, this is effectively the contents of that file. Um, it's some sort of uh, product listing, we've got a part number, a description and a price. Now, if you look closely, you'll see this character here is not an ASCII character. So this is a C, in fact, if I copy that and paste it in here, it's a Latin small letter C with cedilla. That's the little hook thing on the bottom. So, even though I have 
made no allowances in my Perl script, this seems to work. So the file was saved with UTF-8, um, but we haven't mentioned UTF-8 here. Um, we read the file, we printed it out, it all just worked. Now, what I want to do is I want to replace those currency names where it says GBP with the currency symbol for the pound and EUR to the euro and USD to the dollar, um, which I can just do by typing those things into my Perl script. Um, ironically, the only thing um, that uh, is a little bit complicated is I have to put a backslash in front of the dollar, even though it's um, an ASCII character. It, it um, is special to Perl, so we need to escape that. So now when I run this script, um, the, the currency names have been replaced with the relevant symbols. And once again, it just worked. So that's great. But you might be thinking, well, Perl scripts don't usually look like that. Normally we would have some boilerplate at the start of the script. We would turn on um, strictures, we would turn on warnings, add some error checking for our um, open syscall, and maybe specify a minimum version number. So this would be a, a fairly standard um, sort of boilerplate you might expect at the start, start of a Perl script. So if we add this in and run our program again, it continues to work. So that's great. So you might um, have written some code like this, um, you might um, have tested it, found it's doing what you want, and then you submit that uh, perhaps to the Quahub project for review. And uh, a reviewer might come back and say to you, you have got in your code some non-ASCII characters that when you saved the file, you saved it as UTF-8, so you need to include this line, use UTF-8, in order to tell Perl that the source code is encoded in UTF-8. So you add that in, you run your program again, and it all goes to heck. Um, first of all, we've got this um, warning has appeared in the middle of our data, um, our euro symbol seems to be working, but the pound symbol has been replaced by a question mark and a black diamond. Um, and we've had some sort of explosion over here where the C with the cedilla has been turned into two very different characters. So to fix these problems, we first need to understand what went wrong. And the important concept is that Perl has uh, two different types of strings. It can deal with strings of bytes and it can deal with strings of characters or code points. So you can think of this as binary versus text and it's perfectly possible to, to use Perl to deal with binary data. So the language needs to support binary um, but also needs to support character-based data. So each um, Perl scalar, um, here we're talking about the um, C-level data structure that Perl uses to represent each variable. So they each have a flag, or they have a number of flags, but one is used to indicate whether the string contains bytes or code points or characters. So that um, flag is confusingly called the UTF-8 flag. Now I say it's confusing because it kind of implies that this character is encoded as UTF-8 and if you're trying to produce UTF-8 output, then you can just send that on out. But that's not the case. In fact, that's exactly not the case. Um, now, we don't need to know the exact details, but I will just say that Perl's internal representation of a character is similar to UTF-8, but it's not exactly the same. But you just need to know that Perl has stored that character or string of characters in a way that allows it to know the code point for each character. And it's 
It's exactly that. It's an internal representation. It's not intended to be just spat out in the output to the real world. So if I were to read some bytes from a file, I could use the encode module, which provides encode and decode functions. Here I'm decoding those bytes from UTF-8 into Perl's internal representation of characters. Um, so that's one way to deal with um, reading UTF-8. Going the other way, if you have a character string and you want to output it to the real world, you need to encode it into some encoding and this function will encode it to UTF-8. But there are other choices. Um, in both cases, you could specify a different encoding if you knew the file was in some other encoding. So to summarize that, we have this representation that Perl uses internally for characters and character strings inside its memory. Now, when you read data in, you'll be reading bytes and you will need to decode them into Perl's internal representation. But when you want to output something, you need to output bytes. So you need to encode those characters into bytes. So in summary, decode on input, encode on output. Now, sometimes when you're dealing with a byte string, there are, there are some operations that you might perform on a string that will cause it to be upgraded from a byte string to a character string. And that's what happened in our case. We have, um, with our regular expression, um, the, the pattern we're matching and the replacement text that we want to plug in. The replacement text is now a character string. And that's happened because we put use UTF-8 at the start of our script. So that told Perl when it read in the source code, it needed to decode those bytes from the file into character string um, in memory. So when we apply this regex, when we read a line of bytes, apply this regex which plugs in a character, that um, string gets upgraded from a byte string to a character string. And unfortunately, at that point, we no longer have the information about what type of encoding was used. So that, that accidental upgrade um, doesn't work out well for us. Um, here's a function um, which you will never need. Um, it is possible to use this function to check that flag I mentioned earlier. So if you had a variable, dollar $string in this case, and you wanted to check whether it was a character string or a byte string, you could do that using this flag. But you'll never need to do that if you follow the simple rule of decode the bytes on input and encode the bytes on output. Um, and then you can simply assume all your strings are character strings. Um, as I mentioned earlier, that name, the UTF-8 flag, is, is quite misleading and people often, at least initially, think I'll check that flag, and if the data is already UTF-8, I can just print it out. So, the output we were getting, uh, one of the problems was this message saying wide character in print. And this is, this, this term, a wide character, is one that you will see when you're attempting typically an output operation where you've taken a character string and you've used it in a context that expects a byte string. So a wide character is simply a character outside the ASCII range. 
they can only occur in character strings. So you must have done some decoding, possibly via use UTF-8, to get into this situation. Perl can only output bytes, so it needs to know how to convert a character string into bytes, and that's, that can be done. Um, we saw earlier the encode and the decode functions. Um, you could do that manually on every I.O. operation, but that gets a bit tedious. Um, you can specify what's called an output encoding layer. So what I've done here is I've added this line that says take the standard output file handle and add this encoding layer onto it. So when we print to that file handle, character strings will be passed through this um, pre-written piece of code that will convert from characters to UTF-8 bytes. So with that one line in place, we no longer get the um, warning message and our pound symbol um, is working again. It's the one that got turned into a question mark in a diamond. But we still have a problem over here where we read in um, a character, the, the C with the cedilla, and we're expecting that to be output, but it's been turned into two separate characters. And that's because we didn't decode it from UTF-8 uh, when we read it in, so it was just a string of bytes. And when we go to encode it using that output encoding layer, each byte will be converted into a Unicode code point. So to fix that, um, when we open the file, we can specify, um, we can use the bin mode function again, pass it the file handle, and specify that same encoding um, layer parameter. Now, what's happening here um, if you recall, this is input, so we should be decoding, and yet this keyword says encoding. This layer knows which to do depending on whether you open the file for writing, in which case it will encode, or reading, in which case it will decode. So we use the same um, syntax for both. Now, you can actually combine these two lines. When you open the file, um, you tell it, um, you're opening it for reading, and you can combine this parameter in there. So you can um, specify it like that. Um, also, when you specify um, an encoding conversion layer like this, you, you don't have to use UTF-8. There are other options. You can put a different encoding name in there. But since that's the most common option that people are likely to use, there's actually a shorter version of it. You can just say colon UTF-8. Um, now, that is safe for output. Um, it's deemed not safe for input. And what the, the distinction is that this simple conversion is not the exact same code that you're using here. Um, and this version checks each character that, as it converts from bytes to characters, it, it checks that it got valid character as a result whereas this one does not. So um, you should probably avoid using, using that for input. Um, another approach would be to not specify every time you open a file, or, or um, in our case, when we try, before we started using standard output, we specified an encoding layer. But you could alternatively add this pragma at the top of your script to say, every open function should automatically push on this encoding translation layer. Um, now the thing about that is that it, it only works with files that we open. And standard in, standard out, and standard error, we don't open. We inherit them as open file handles. So the, you, if you want them to be encoded as well, you need to add this um, um, colon std on the end. So, now with these, this pragma in place, um, 
nothing special down here. Our code works exactly as we might have hoped. Our C Cedilla is coming out. Our Euro and pound symbols are working and there are no unexpected warning messages. So if I go back to that slide, the trouble started when we added use UTF-8 um, and the problems were solved when we either added this or added individual encoding layers on the input and the output side. So at the risk of laboring this point, when we read in the bytes Initially, we were just, no conversion was happening. We were just reading bytes and printing out bytes, and that seemed to work fine. The regular expression was initially replacing bytes with bytes, so it continued to work. But the use UTF-8 introduced these character semantics, um, which are useful. So, you know, it was, it was a good idea to add that, but then we needed to tell um, Perl how to take those character strings that resulted and encode them to UTF-8 on output, but also we needed to tell it how to decode, the, in our case, the source code from bytes to character strings. So that was an example. Um, I mentioned earlier that if we had a, an ASCII um, character number, so for example, 65, and we wanted to see that character, um, we could use the chr command um, for Unicode characters. It works the exact same way. You just give it bigger numbers. Um, and in this case, that's decimal, and we get the euro symbol, but we could um, specify hex um, or even binary. Um, and there's an example of a really large unwieldy binary number that you can understand why we would use hex rather than binary for that. Um, you can also use this escape code. We saw backslash x before, which was followed by two hex digits to make a, a byte defined by its hex number. If we put curly braces around the um, hex digits, then what we're doing is specifying um, a code point. We can use more than two digits if we need to. Um, and you can also use backslash capital N and then put the name of the character in um, the curly braces. So if we were getting the results we wanted with bytes, um, and the trouble started when we started working with characters, why bother working with characters, you might ask. Um, as an example of something that can go wrong, if you were looking at this code, it appears in each of these cases you've got a one character string, so you would expect the length function to return one, but in fact, um, it's just counting the number of bytes because these are byte strings. On the other hand, if you use UTF-8 as an effect, um, these are now all character strings, and so the length function returns the same, uh, the value one in each case, which is probably what we would have expected. Um, if we took that a bit further and we had um, strings like this, and we wanted to remove that first one. We wanted to extract characters from positions one through to four. Um, we could use substring and give it, give it um, a range, sorry, one through five, the four characters from position one. Um, we'd get this mess of output because once again, these are just byte strings. And so Perl takes that to mean byte number one instead of character number one and it's come in part way through a three byte character. Whereas with use UTF-8 in effect, those all work exactly the way you would expect them to. Um, another thing uh, you can do with characters is case conversions. So here we have um, a place name um, It has here we have a lowercase o with a macron, but we want to use the uc first function to uppercase the first character. Um, but it didn't do that. 
the string output was exactly the same as the input. And the reason, once again, is because this is a byte string. So um, the UC first function looked at the first byte of the string and thought, well, that's not a lowercase character. I'll leave it untouched. Whereas with used bytes, uh, sorry, use UTF-8 in effect, it will um, recognize the multi-byte character as a lowercase letter it will replace it with the uppercase equivalent. So characters are good. When should we use them? Should we always use them? But no, we need to consider are we working with text data or are we working with binary data? We should use characters for text, we should use bytes for binary. And when I say we should use characters, I mean we should decode the bytes on input and encode the characters on output. So, as um, a quick quiz, this will be non-interactive, <laughs> um, if we were generating HTML, would we be better to use characters or bytes? And I think most of us would realize or agree that characters is um, almost certainly what we want to use. Um, it may be that um, you're using a templating language like, like template toolkit, in which case you might need to tell it how to decode the files, the template files that it's reading, so that the template uses characters. And then when you're outputting the result, you might need to specify an encoding on the output. Um, if you're using um, PLAC or PSGI, you need to bear in mind that the body of a response needs to be bytes, so that then the content length header is a, is a count of the bytes. So putting those two things together, you will end up with a system where you can simply use non-ASCII characters in your templates. They'll flow through and be combined with um, data and produce well-formed pages on the output. So HTML characters. What about if you were generating an image? Is that um, characters or bytes? In this case, I'm using um, a module to produce a bar graph in PNG format. So you can see down here, I've, I've created an object and then I'm calling its PNG method and I'm printing the result out on a file handle. And in this case, we need to use bytes. We don't want um, UTF-8 encoding to be applied to our output file handle because a PNG file is a binary file. The um, patterns of ones and zeros that we write out there will dictate um, the placement and the color of the pixels that make up the image. Um, and so they're in no way um, related to the sort of bit patterns that are required for UTF-8 characters. So if we did have um, that open pragma in place to um, apply a UTF-8 encoding to every file handle, we'd need to turn it off for uh, printing out our um, image file. Uh, so here I could put colon raw to um, put that back into uh, a binary mode to just output the bytes, or maybe not turn on the automatic um, UTF-8 encoding for every file that we open. It actually turns out that um, even without um, bringing Unicode into the mix, if you were doing this, you would almost certainly want to use the bin mode per, uh, function anyway, because there's an output encoding layer that is added by default um, on Windows. Um, if you're running your script on Windows, that converts every line feed character to carriage return line feed, which is the convention for text files on Windows. Um, and that also can make a mess of your PNG file. So by specifying bin mode and um, 
file handle, it turns off that output encoding layer. Back to our quiz, if you were reading XML, is that bytes or is that characters? Now this is a trick question because if HTML is characters, surely XML is characters as well. Um, but no, um, XML is what's known as a self-describing data format. So um, it might start with byte watermark, it um, might start, follow that um, with a um, XML declaration, um, which includes a declaration of the encoding that has been used, um, and um, if that XML declaration was missing and the byte watermark was missing, it's, it's well defined what the default fallback position should be. So if we were to read in, um, open a file, and we had this in automatic encoding layer happening, if we read in a file and the bytes were converted to characters, and then we pass the character string to our XML parsing module, then that would break. The parsing module is expecting to see the raw bytes from the file or, or the serialized version of that document, and it needs to see the bytes in the form that, that they were originally written. It, it doesn't know how to deal with Perl's um, character strings. So, um, in this case, you probably wouldn't go to the trouble of opening a file and reading it in because you can simply tell um, this parser library the name of the file and it will open it. And when it opens it, it will make sure it has the right um, uh, mode on there with, with no encoding layers happening. Next one, JSON data file format. Bytes or characters? Um, once again, this is a trick question. Um, the answer is bytes. Um, if you have a data structure and um, you encode it using JSON XS or one of the forks of that, what you get back is a byte string. So if you print that out and you have an output encoding layer happening, it will get converted from the byte string into a corrupted byte string. Remember those output encoding layers only work on characters. And if you give them bytes, it treats each byte as a character. So um, if we wanted, um, if, if we didn't have an output encoding happening, it would come through appropriately. But if we set that um, automatic encoding layer, when we printed it out, the data would get corrupted. So if you were writing some code that's returning JSON, um, you almost certainly don't want an encoding layer on that output. Alternatively, the encode JSON function is functionally equivalent to this, this object-oriented version here where we create an encoder um, object, we set this option on it to tell it to do the encoding to UTF-8. So if we omitted that bit, then what we're getting back is a character string, and if we do have an automatic encoding layer in effect, the characters will get converted to bytes, as we expect. Um, there is another approach you could take where instead of saying UTF-8, you could say ASCII and the output will use only ASCII characters and any, um, any non-ASCII characters will be encoded using the backslash U um, escape code. So uh, this can be quite handy. Um, I do, do recommend the use of this if you're producing some JSON that's going to be handed around and you don't know, you don't have control over the software that might be reading it. Um, then 
or the network protocol that might be used to transfer it. And so if you keep it as plain ASCII all the way, then that will be safer. Um, if you are reading JSON, um, once again, the um, decode function is expecting to read bytes. So if you have, um, here I've got use UTF-8 in effect and, and my source code has a string of JSON with um, a Unicode character in it, then that's just going to blow up when, when the JSON parser hits that character. So if you're dealing with reading JSON, you want to hand the parser a byte string. In this case, um, I used that same trick of creating a decoder object that doesn't expect to um, see bytes. So it doesn't start by translating from bytes to characters. So as a rule of thumb, if you're not sure whether you should be using bytes or um, characters, if you're using a parser module, in my examples I had uh, the libxml parser and later the json parser, um, parser modules almost always expect bytes. Um, but the documentation will tell you, I'm sure. And that was where my um, presentation was set to end on the day. I did have some bonus material and here we're not pushed for time, so I'll plow on into that um, and briefly talk about uh, this concept of normalization. Um, here you can see I've got what appears to be the same line twice, but in fact these two strings are different. Um, and if I um, if I um, expand those out in a different way, you can see the first um, one has the, the first three letters of CAFE followed by character E9, which is a lowercase e with a um, accent on the top there. If we go over to our character finder, in fact, if I copy that and go to the character finder and paste, um, now we can see this one is a combining character. If I go back um, and copy this one and paste it in, that is a single character that is a small letter E with an acute symbol on top. Now, if we open up the scratch pad, um, I'll clear that out. If I add this character to the scratch pad, I can view um, a string or, or a character here as text, so it just presents it like that, or as code points. So in this case, I can see that one is E9. Now, if I decompose that, if I normalize it to the decomposed form, that is um, an E with an acute symbol. So those are two separate characters. The second one is a combining character that um, can be added to a base character. Um, now that I've put it into this form, um, this normalized decomposed form, uh, if I switch back to text, it looks the same, but now because it's two separate Unicode code points, if I put my cursor at the end and hit backspace, um, backspace, oh, sorry, I was, wasn't watching. Um, so I'll do that again. Decomposed. Back to text. Cursor here, hit backspace, and it just deletes the acute symbol and leaves me with the E. So if you had a couple of strings that you wanted to compare, 
are these two the same, uh, there are some characters that could be represented in different ways. And to the human eye, these two look like the same character, but they've been formed in different ways. So if you need to do some sort of comparison, um, then you might want to use a normalized form. Um, the Unicode standard defines some rules for normalizing um, characters. Uh, there are two terms here. Canonical equivalence is what we were looking at with the E9 character, um, and that's relatively strict. It will, will say this um, E9 character is equivalent to a lowercase e with the combining acute symbol. Um, the compatibility equivalence is a bit more of a fuzzy um, uh, concept where characters that, um, strictly speaking, are not exactly the same will be treated as equivalent because to the human eye they look the same. So, for example, there are quite a few characters um, that are letters from our, our standard English alphabet, but the, the, they're designated for use in mathematical functions. Um, to the human eye, they just look like letters. Um, canonical equivalents would not treat them as equivalent to those letters. Compatible equivalents would. So when you do the normalization, you can um, select a function that either does um, compatibility or um, defaults to canonical equivalents and you can convert to the composed form which will be the single character that includes the base and the accent or the decomposed form which separates them, represents them as separate characters. Um, if you're uh, dealing with databases um, up till now, I've been talking about files and standard output, but it's uh, very likely that you'll be um, storing your data in, in a database and getting it back later. Um, and the same sorts of rules apply, that if it's textual data, you will want it to be in uh, character format, um, but other columns in your database, which might be, for example, integers or floating point values, um, their binary values being um, sent across the network uh, to and from the database and you wouldn't want the encoding to apply to them. So typically your database driver module will be able to handle that for you. Um, in the case of Postgres, there's this flag PG enable UTF-8, um, which if you turn that on, it will enable the character conversion for text fields but safely leave other data types untouched. Um, and that's so useful that in fact, it, with more recent versions of the Postgres driver, that's actually the default behavior and you would need to use this option to turn it off um, if for some reason you wanted to achieve that. Um, MySQL um, has UTF-8 support. Um, and somehow they managed to screw that up. So there is um, a special, uh, there's a type UTF-8 MB3, which is um, UTF-8, but only up to three bytes long. So it doesn't support the characters that require four bytes. Um, if you're putting UTF-8 data in your database, you don't want to be thinking about how many bytes will this translate to. So you probably want to use this UTF-8 MB4 version, which can support up to four byte characters. Um, I think if you just say UTF-8, it defaults to this one that's restricted to three bytes. So that's something to be aware of. Um, and when you um, connect to the database, like Postgres, there is a database specific um, flag that you can set to say, do the conversions to and from um, Perl character strings for me. Um, and 
I think finally here, um, just wanted to briefly mention um, this module that I wrote years ago. Um, and to understand what it does, I'll just uh, tell you the story of how it came to be. We had a database that was um, a Postgres database using what's called SQL ASCII encoding. And I thought that that meant it could only contain ASCII data. But what it actually meant was Postgres didn't really care. It just took whatever bytes were sent to it and it stored them in the database. Um, and we had to, at some point in its lifetime, convert it to a Unicode database because we needed to support um, some accented characters. Uh, so we took the database dump, we created a Unicode database and went to restore it and the restore failed. And it turned out that we had uh, one table in particular uh, that was being used to log um, when we had data validation failures. When people submitted things, their application rejected um, for reasons I don't need to go into, we were actually logging that in the database. Um, and so we had all sorts of interesting stuff in that table. Now, one thing I failed to mention earlier when I was talking about HTML is um, I was only talking about sending data to the browser. But if you're doing a form submission, so the browser is sending data back to the application, the browser needs to know how to encode what the user typed or pasted um, into some form that the server can handle. And it's um, the convention that's used is that if the page has a header saying it for, it's, for example, UTF-8, then the browser will use that same encoding to submit the form. You can um, include an attribute on your form tag to make that explicit, but these days everyone uses UTF-8, so you can pretty much assume that that's, that's the default you're going to receive. Um, but this was a very old system. It had some very old um, data in there that had come from some even older browsers. So um, we ended up with our dump file containing some data that was um, ASCII, some that was Latin 1, some that was the Windows version of Latin 1, and some that was UTF-8. Now, tools like iConv are great for converting from a file in one encoding to another, but we had a file in at least four encodings um, that we needed to convert to Unicode. So this module was one that we created um, to massage the data. Now, normally when you use PG Restore with Postgres, you tell it which database to restore into. Um, if you don't specify a database, then it produces SQL on standard output. So you can pass that through a filter um, and then pipe that into PSQL to um, have those filtered SQL statements executed in the database. So that's what this module um, provides, um, a, a command that you can use as a filter and also some functions so that you can use that in your... Um, in your code directly if you need to. Um, but I would say, um, if at all possible, avoid getting into a situation where you need to do this. Um, the module is applying some rules to, to look at each byte and say, um, is this byte conceivably part of a valid UTF-8 sequence? And if so, it assumes that that's what it is. Um, Otherwise, if it's not ASCII, it kind of assumes it's Windows Latin 1. Um, and so there's a bit, of, a bit of guesswork going on in there, and you really don't want to be guessing with your data. So this is a module that exists. If, if you find yourself in the situation where you need it, then it's great that it exists, but don't overuse it. Um, you don't want it in, in the pipeline for, for every um, database or data import. Um, operation. And so that really is the end. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'm just a bit sorry that we couldn't see as many of you as we hoped to see in person at the conference.